so let's talk names. I think, you know, maybe the, the best way to begin the conversation is like on a personal note and with your own personal journey with your name, a journey to which I can relate as a man named Brad, which is a cultural signifier for douchebag in the United States of America. <laughs> I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that. That the, I would. Are, well, are we actually interviewing now, or we're just chatting? Yeah. Oh, no, we're we're going. We're going. <laughs> um, what I would say is that if you don't believe me, just look at any movie or television show made in America where there's a character named Brad. It's never good news. It's never good. It's always a guy who is just reprehensible. <laughs> I honestly have not made that connotation. Certainly the name Dick, you know, that's just it's, so I feel obvious. Like, I feel like Dick, I feel like Dick is like, there are certain names like mine that have like uh, accrued this kind of cultural baggage for whatever reason. And it's an interesting question. Like why certain names like Brad and Chad have become these sort of, you know, repositories for <laughs> like people's hatred of a certain kind of guy. But yeah, I think that a name like Dick, there are other names like Dick that I think are on the endangered species list. I think they're going to actually die out like before yeah. too long, you know? Yeah. So, well, I, I think that sort of touches on the, the parental responsibility and that, you know, our names are, it's sort of the first choice that we don't make for ourselves in life. You know, our names are conferred on us by our parents typically. Um, and it is either a gift or an affliction. And I think it does fall under the realm of parents to, you know, to really take that seriously. It's a huge responsibility and uh, to think about that and, you know, no offense to the dicks out there and their parents, but I just don't know who would do that. <laughs> There can't what? be a dick on planet Earth who was born after like 1955 or 19, you know, like maybe, I don't know, but it seems yeah. like it's, it's an old, an old person's name at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, I love that we've just led with Dick and I, <laughs> I think subliminally it's this Yeti microphone <laughs> that's so phallic and I've just, <laughs> I'm running with Dick's out the gate. <laughs> that's right. If, if there's ever an opportunity on this program to lead with Dick, I'd like to try <laughs> to go there, but, uh, I'm, I'm glad I was able to do that. It's yeah. Funny. Yeah. Congratulations. And I think that, uh, your name, which I quite like has been complicated for you, right? Ethel? Yeah, it has. Um, and I've only recently, honestly, come to like it myself. Um, I, and so much of, of that, whether our name is indeed a gift or an affliction, it, we do have power over that. So much of it is our own attitude and whether we embrace or reject the name. I just didn't have that sort of mindset until I suppose I did much more personal growth in many other areas of my life. But certainly my early years, you know, I was born and raised in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I'm from the north side, a working class area. I was coming up, you know, the 70s, 80s, um, when Ireland was particularly nationalist. You know, the troubles, as they were called in Northern Ireland, the sectarian violence was at a height. And it was very much an anti-British atmosphere. Uh, and here I am with Ethel, uh, a name which had sort of... There is, you know, it's it's both. It's on both ends of the spectrum, whether it's sort of this sort of rough working class name or whether it's this very elegant, grand name. And I think my accent never fit my neighborhood. I think my entire demeanor, um, my my presence didn't fit my neighborhood. And then you add on that this name Ethel, which I think because of who I was, just had this sort of grander connotations and I didn't fit in. And uh, those around me made it very clear <laughs> that I didn't fit in. And uh, there was a lot of teasing around my name, a lot of nicknaming, you know, kettle, nettle, uh, kind of versions were petal. Uh, but it was always just the reaction. You know, we present ourselves, you know, hi, my name is, or hi, what's your name? And Ethel just always triggered a negative reaction, certainly in my early years, um, in more you know, the second half of my life, it's more the reaction that you're expressing, like, oh, Ethel, you know, that's unusual. That's, that's nice. I like it. Uh, but it always gets a reaction. And, and that has an effect, um, as opposed to, you know, the Marys or whatever that sort of goes through. Um, so it definitely impressed on me from a very early age. Um, 
the power of naming and how it can shape us, the effect it has on us and how it can misshape us. And for much, much too much of my life, I allowed it to misshape me. Well, it's interesting. It, it really is interesting to think about the ways in which names might have an impact on how our life unfolds. <laughs> like, is that too much power to give to a name that if you name someone or misname someone, uh, that it could affect their destiny? I, I know that's such a, a grand statement to make and it's, it's very general, but I do think it has a huge impact. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned mispronouncing names. I'm, I'm just off a, a book event and, um, you know, the individual who introduced myself and my interviewer, who's a, you know, South Asian writer, she butchered her last name. And I know she found it upsetting. I found it upsetting. It, it just seems such an unnecessary, painful um, slight to make, you know, to, to mispronounce a name. It's so simple to take a person aside for a moment before an event and just double check, you know, ideally beforehand. But if you need to ask the person directly, and I think that's huge. I think that does have a big effect. Um, you know, it's a signifier of respect. It's a signifier of recognizing their identity, their whole personhood. Um, and that's just the more recent example of it. But I think we see it over and over again. Um, the naming, the misnaming, nicknaming, um, you know, both in life and in literature, we see a lot of that. Um, and I think it does have a very big impact. As I say, a very grand statement to say, it does it shape one's destiny? I think it can. I think maybe I, rather than the broader it does, I think it can. I think that... I can play like head games with myself where I will look at, say, a writer. I mean, like, let's just get really basic about this. Like Ernest Hemingway. Well, of course he was a Nobel Prize winning. <laughs> like, that's like the most like literary sounding name. But then the head game that I'll play is like, well, maybe it sounds literary just because I already know the context. But certain names sound right. And it's like, well, of course that person has been embraced by the culture at a high level and has been lauded. Like not only has the work got to be good, but you got to have the right name. Yeah, I think that's so true. Um, you know, and I went through that probably 15 years ago when I started writing professionally, thinking about my name. I, I was married and um, I have always kept my maiden name, which is Ethel McDonald. Uh, and I actually had a conversation with my father and he said to me who his name was, Ned McDonald. And he said, well, you know, if I was going to be a writer, I'd adopt a pen name like Ethel McDonald. It's just, oh, it's not doing it. It's not doing it. You know, now take me, for example, you know, Ned McDonald. I would choose Nathaniel Bergman. And I've never forgotten that, you know, Nathaniel Bergman. And I did. I had such a like, oh, what a great name. You know, it's like the actress Ingrid Bergman. I think you're right. Like, I think names like that carry such energy um, and such currency. And I think, yes, you can't but become something bigger, you know, in life based on those kind of names. So or or something smaller if your name isn't right. Like like let me use another really basic one. Like would Bob Dylan be Bob Dylan if he had come out and was like, I'm Bob Zimmerman? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And I don't think we do know. And then as you say, is it, is it after the fact, you know, Bob Dylan is Bob Dylan, you know, because of the journey he's had, because of, you know, his music, his, his songwriting. I mean, he's had an incredible career and incredible effect on, uh, you know, the culture on, on our history as we're living is, uh, he's huge. So yes, which came first, you know, the Bob Dylan or our, our um, understanding and how we receive Bob Dylan, the name. Um, I think you could probably argue either way for that. And I think that gets back to earlier what I discovered for myself, that it is so much one's attitude to oneself and to one's name and kind of, you know, what you're going to do with it and how hard and how well you're going to make it work for yourself. Yeah, you, I mean, I think that that's the thing is that you come full circle on this and it's like, ultimately, 
if you yourself are comfortable with you yourself and your name, other people are likely to go along with it. I don't think temperamentally, I mean, I can barely bear Brad, but if, if like my name were Dick, <laughs> I think like every time I talk to anyone for the first time, I would have to be making a joke about it. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I could never get a comfort, I don't think I could ever get to a comfort level with certain names where I just like walked into a room and was like, yeah, I'm Dick Listy. <laughs> like, no way. I would, I, I'm too self-conscious. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I would have to reference. Dick I would have Listy. To, oh God. Yeah. You've got to talk about the elephant in the room, don't you? I mean, how, who, yeah. are these, who yeah. are these people who are just like, nope, I've let it go. You know, I'm just going to be completely carefree and I don't get that. Well, when I was when I was a teen for quite some time, I I really wanted to legally change my name. Um and I don't think we could have afforded it and I think my parents' reaction would be, you know, sort of a smack on the top of my head and you know, who do you think you are and your name's your name and just get on with it. Um but that is, you know, how much I rejected it and how much I hated it and I really had gotten to the point Again, teens, young adulthood, where if somebody said my name in public, particularly loudly, like if they, they were calling after me on the street, I would flinch. Like I really just had this very negative association with this, um, you know, bordering on that it was traumatic. Um, and so I did seriously consider changing it. And then I think it was just that sense of, you know, not having the resources, not even knowing how on earth I would go about that. You know, we're talking pre-internet um, and it just seemed me like it would be way too much trouble. So for several years, I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll suck it up. You know, what what choice do I have kind of thing? Um, but I suppose that is one choice we have later in life that we can choose to change it. Um, I know a lot of people will select a, a second name. You know, I'm Ethel Celine, Catherine Mary, McDonnell. Um, I could have picked any other of those names. And in fact, my mother had strongly considered calling me Celine for quite some time, then worried people would call me silly. Um, <laughs> so again, is how we internalize things. You know, so much of the rest of my life, you know, I, I was not in a good place, you know, dysfunctional family. Uh, and so in my head, I would hear Ethel silly. And again, this is something that I just allowed become much bigger than it was. Um, but you, you sort of get stuck on things, especially, I think, younger in life. Um, and that had a profound effect on me, too. I also had learning differences. So it was just the sort of culmination of things that, again, at the root, came down to my name. Well, and I feel like, I mean, unless you really, really struggle with it, you get to a certain age and it's like, well, what's the point of changing it? Everyone knows yeah. me as this one name. I change it. Everyone's just going to find that to be some sort of weird affectation that could even surpass the original name. <laughs> Absolutely. You yeah. Know? That's such a great point. Yeah. Uh, but I do, I do believe that if you are a writer or I guess some sort of performing artist or something, that is maybe the one caveat where I think people could potentially accept a name change as a kind of stage name or pen name because there's a precedent for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and various reasons for it, you know, whether it's, you know, I'm thinking of uh, the Irish writer, John Banville, who, you know, wanted to break into a completely different genre to what he was so well known for Cause you, we do sort of get pigeonholed, whether it's an actor in certain roles, uh, et cetera. Uh, but he wanted to, to break into crime writing. And he felt that was such a departure from what his readers knew him as that he almost needed a completely separate persona to go in, step into that field. Um, and I know JK Rowling wrote under a different pen oh, name right. for the same reason that she went into, I think tried for more literary mystery. I'm not quite sure, but um, yeah. So, so there is that sense of, of, there can be justifications for adopting different names. And the idea of persona, I know Beyonce early in her career adopted persona because of stage fright. Um, and she found it incredibly empowering. And I, I can totally get that. You know, I have uh, my oldest daughter, uh, uh, majored in musical theater and she's a beautiful singing voice but she's talked about how she does not like performing as herself in front of an audience um you know just being the singer on the stage she loves being in character you know wh whatever musical it is and then she's not herself she's the persona of the character and she has so much more confidence and feels so freer 
you know, I sort of liken it to Halloween and putting on costumes or karaoke and you're handed that microphone, something happens, you know, we become something bigger than ourselves. It's this extra layer that the costume gives us, the extra layer the microphone gives us. And that idea of, of changing our name, assuming different names, I think gives us different layers. And I, I thought about that too, you know, about what if I, because... <laughs> writing life is so hard and there have been different periods of, you know, disillusionment. And what if I just started all over again, you know, clean the slate, um, adopt a pen name, see what happens, maybe try a completely different genre, romance, sci-fi, whatever. Um, I've toyed with all of that. And, and it can be fun, but, you know, if you want to seriously consider it, it does have, again, a big sense of responsibility. It has ramifications you know it's not something to take on lightly i don't think no but i think like that's probably a more common thought exercise than most writers probably talk about especially i think writers of a certain age if you are trying to publish i mean the publishing industry loves the hot debut right yes and so yeah. if you're a mid-list author who's on her fourth or fifth book or something and has never done like gangbuster sales. I think the temptation to- <laughs> This is sounding very familiar, Brad. Uh, hey, to <laughs> you and me both. You and yeah, me both. very relatable. <laughs> yeah, and I think relatable to what, 99% of authors. And so I think right. the, the point is that the temptation to say, you know what, I'm going to write this novel, but I'm going to write it under a completely new identity and yeah. I'm going to have my agent take it out and present it as a debut- would that change the calculus in terms of its appeal? I've definitely had that thought. I, I have no idea what the legalese is to any of that. Um, I don't know. Um, when I flew from London to San Francisco last week, I watched American fiction on the plane. And I, I just love that. And again, that idea of just writing something completely different under a different name and see how it flies, you know, um, Maybe, maybe they'll like this version of me. You know? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. You know, maybe this will fly. Um, and you're right. There is such currency to the debut. And, you know, you only get to do that once. Um, or multiple times if you or are multiple just an times. assassin. <laughs> just a, a multi-named assassin with a absolutely killer business instincts. I don't know. I, you know, it's definitely yeah. something that I have entertained. I think, like, the it was more in the context of, like, what if I wrote a children's book or something, would I write it under my name or would I take on some sort of pen name that's like yeah. a little goofy and memorable or something? I think I might do that, but I haven't written said children's book yet. It's just been kind of a, a little fantasy. So I'm curious to know a little bit more about why your parents named you Ethel. I don't think you gave us the full oh, story. So, yeah. So I was named after my mother's great aunt who would have been my great, great aunt Ethel. Um, never met her, didn't know anything about her other than that repetitious, she was a great lady. That's that's what my mom would say about her all the time. Um, and again, it just I just felt pressure from that. Um, I felt this sense of I had to be this grand lady. Um, and again, just so contrary to the environment that I was growing up in. Um, and I think for my mother, you know, it was a sense of it, it was it was bigger than just naming me and it being this namesake, it was, I think for her, she wanted, she had six children, you know, there's three boys, three girls. And, um, we, we were essentially poor. I mean, we really, really struggled. Sometimes it was hard to get food on the table. Um, and I think she just wanted so much more for us. And so there was this idea of, of giving the sort of unusual grander names, I think was part of her hopes for us that we would somehow lead a different path in life than maybe those around us. And certainly than she had. Um, my brother is named Brinsley. <laughs> so if I think Sounds I like had a badge with Ethel, <laughs> yeah, but he had the benefit of being able to, to change it to Bren. So it, it, he got away lighter because people didn't often ask past the Bren. I was, oh, hi, Bren. You know, I think they presumed it was shortened for Brendan, very typical Irish name. And I, nobody would ever imagine it was Brinsley. So, um, and Ethel, there was just no way to sort of change it or shorten it or, you know, Eth just doesn't quite, <laughs> right. doesn't quite do it. Um, 
but yeah, that, that also was part of it. And for my most recent novel, you know, I made that choice to call my main character Esther Prynne, you know, a near namesake to Hester Prynne of the Scarlet Letter. Right. Because I knew from lived experience, the sort of added tension to that. And of course, that's what we're always trying to do in storytelling. We're trying to add tension in various ways. Um, and I knew giving her that name and her also having like a, a love hate relationship with that name and having the experience of when we meet people, it's sort of always a topic of conversation. It's always remarked upon. Um, and that I knew would be a great source of tension too. And then it was just interesting to think about the, the why of the naming of her and not all of it ended up in the final manuscript, but that for me was a way sort of into the character, into her family, into her background, into the various things that shaped her. So I knew it would be a rich literary device to do that. Um, and, you know, even in my events, it sort of comes up, you know, why on earth did you call your your main character Esther Prynne of all names? Um, so really, I had a lot of fun with this and, and, and it didn't disappoint me in that it did offer up plenty in terms of, of uh, tension and also revealing the character. And I had a really um, powerful experience with one of my secondary characters, um, who eventually was named Lily, but in the first two, if not three drafts of the novel, I had named her Nikki. And that was a nod to the real life character, Nicole, who I, um, was drawing on. It was really sort of, uh, Nicole died, um, several years ago. And this was a friend of yours. Yes. This is a friend of mine. Yeah. Here in, here in the Bay area. And, um, I didn't, I didn't consciously do it at first. It was sort of like this character appeared on the page and I'm like, oh, God, this is so Nicole. This is sort of her spirit, her essence. Um, I thought, well, I don't want to call her Nicole. I'll call her Nikki. But as I wrote, she remained Nikki slash Nicole and her, Nicole's personality being mirrored in the story was not serving the story. It was, it was almost a, a surreal experience where time and time again, the character would show me, no, you're, you're putting me in situations. You're putting me in scenes. You're having me do and say things that are not fitting the story and the moment and who I actually am, which I know it may sound a little bizarre, but it was, it was an extraordinary experience. It was really the first time I felt how little I was in control as the creator of the story. Um, I really felt that my characters and this one character who I said, I ended up renaming Lily. And once I renamed her, it was extraordinary how the story then flowed and how I felt just much more confident as a storyteller. I felt like, okay, now she is responding the way this character would respond. And I had then spent a lot of time sort of, she's not Nicole. I really need to get clear of that in my mind. So then I would do writing exercise. And um, I sometimes write when I'm stuck like that, when I'm unsure, I write with my non-dominant hand, which in this case was my left hand. And so I would do sort of, interview like scenes with Lily and it's like, okay, Lily, who are you? You know, what's your story? How did you end up? My novel is based in Half Moon Bay. How'd you end up? She's a, a new arrival. How'd you end up in Half Moon Bay? Um, things like that, even her own name, you know, how do you feel about your name that didn't end up in the manuscript, but it was really helpful for me um, to think about in terms of that. And she's a transgender character. So she would have chosen that name for herself. Um, so yeah, again, that was just a really, rich literary device and again all on names and the same for place actually when I chose Half Moon Bay as the setting for the novel it just fit so beautifully thematically with this idea of fracture and incompleteness which is a big theme throughout the novel it's also a place that I could go to visit walk sit by the ocean you know think about my characters think about the story I found that really um nourishing and and um very rewarding in the terms of, you know, just getting the imagination going. And then also that idea of, of place being, you know, Half Moon Bay is one of the sort of cookie cutter seaside towns, you know, California, it's beautiful on the surface and not to misalign Half Moon Bay, but again, as a literary device, it was fantastic to kind of think about, okay, it's so beautiful 
but what's going on? You know, what's the grit? What's the right. underbelly yeah. to this place? Sure. Um, so yeah, again, and, and I, I just did that in this novel in a much more conscious way than I ever have before in terms of names and, um, you know, what could they offer up to me and to the reader? Well, it's the most elemental creative choice or set of creative choices that a writer makes. And in, in, it seems to me anyway, like you think about like naming as it pertains to literature and it's the title of a book, yeah, the name of characters, the name of the setting, the towns, whether they're, you know, I guess, fictional or not. These are critical choices. And yeah. when a book is rendered well, they feel inevitable. They feel just right. Yeah. I think I think most writers care quite a lot about getting names right and can't yeah. probably access characters fully unless they have the character named with just the right name or with what feels like just the right name. And I'm trying yeah. to think of maybe uh, I'm trying to think of a book that has like a title that I don't like or something. You wonder if it colors the reading experience, I guess, is the point. And yeah, it's, I don't know, it's a big responsibility. It's a responsibility that I, in my personal life, like as a writer and as a human being, take quite seriously. Like when yeah. I got a dog, I bought a baby naming book. I've made an exhaustive <laughs> list. I've done this for all my dogs. I'm like, because <laughs> this is what I don't want to live with is I don't want to name the dog. And then like a year later, hear just the right name and realize that it's too late and that I fucked yeah. it up. So I get, I get very I exhausted. Love that. No, I love that. And I, but I think you're absolutely right. And that's sort of full circle to, to what I brought up at the outset of this idea of parental responsibility. Um, I, because it does matter, you know, it, it really does. Um, and I love that. I love that you take that care in the naming of your pets. Well, um, listen, and you, do people take care? I mean, sometimes it comes quickly. Like my daughter, yeah. my wife and I had like one conversation mm -hmm. about my daughter's name for whatever reason. That was it. We had it. Uh, my son, it was a saga. We couldn't decide. Uh, and it became, he now has like four names. You know, we have like <laughs> two middle names. It's a disaster. <laughs> Uh, but, but, I, but I, I, I think that's what also happens is names can become sort of, you know, change based on terms of affection or, you know, that somehow by, by tweaking it just slightly, you're capturing their essence somehow. Like maybe they've more of a rambunctious personality. And so, you know, I don't know, but I, I can see that too. And I've, I've done that with my daughters. Um, you know, my oldest daughter's name, Mackenzie, and I swore that I would not abbreviate it in any way. There would be no nicknames, or, you know, but she grew up and, and, and she grew into herself. And now Mac fits her better than Mackenzie does. Right. So there's that sense. I'm sorry. I feel like I interrupted you when you're talking about your son, but <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying that it's a heavy responsibility that I take seriously. Yeah. And I think that the implications might be bigger than we even realize, or at least they can seem that way. And then as a writing matter, I think that character names, they, they just feel, it's like I'm talking in, entirely out of some sort of intuited sense of it. You know, I have no scientific proof of this, but yeah, if you get like Holden Caulfield, <laughs> like who else could that character be? Like yeah. what other name could you possibly give that guy? And that name, the sound of those words uh, holds so much in my yeah. imagination, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think it, it, these are like momentous decisions that we make, however small, like the brush strokes may be, they have a huge impact. Yeah. I just saw a couple of days ago, a tweet from Aro Kwan on, um, that she had, I think an, an, an opening speech or another author anyway, that, that was speaking at an event and said that, you know, in fiction, in story, every word matters except the characters' names. And, <laughs> you know, there was just this <laughs> onslaught reaction from so many. And just again, saying what we're saying, that no, 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 it's, it's elemental. Uh, you know, it, it determines so, so much. And I think it's so important. And, you talked about titles, you know, for so, so long. And again, I don't know if it's true. I think that's up to the, to the readers to decide. But for quite some time in my writing life, I was sort of hung up on titles and I sort of told myself I'm not good at titles. Um, and I sort of then would 
you know, dash something off and, and hope for the best. And it's not, I, I gave it, a, as you talked earlier, like I was exhausted, exhausted about it, but in the, I, I didn't, I didn't embrace it. I didn't say like, oh, great, that's it. I've got it. It was more, I've done my best. I worked really hard. This seems right. Um, and then with this novel, you know, I have 50 chapters. They're all very short. Singai is the title of the novel itself, but for each chapter, I title them. And again, the work just felt different. It felt like that's what it called for. But I think I also was sort of challenging myself to sort of lean into that fear I had to get unstuck with this. And again, as I said, it's ultimately up to the reader to decide. But I did feel really, really good about it. Um, I really liked every title that I gave to each chapter. Um, the title of the novel itself, Sing I, you know, I think that's sort of going to get a response from people, sort of like trip you up a little bit, like sing what now, yeah. <laughs> um, you know? Uh, and and that's that's sort of, again, a thread, a major theme in, in the novel about how that all came about. But, um, you know, even my publishing team at the outset were a little like, mm, let, let's think about this name. How's this going to work? And, you know, we had various discussions and I was certainly open to changing it, but we ultimately decided, no, this, this does work. And you gave yourself I'm like extra, everything. you gave yourself extra. You said you named each chapter. So yeah, 50. Yes. So you that you're putting a lot of responsibility on yourself. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I feel um, there was growth, you know, for me as a writer and certainly that sense of, you know, I'm never going to fear titles again. Um, I had such ultimately such fun in picking the titles. Um, and I would, I would write the chapter first, that that's what it was. And then I would title it afterwards when I, and it was at a pretty late stage where the chapters were pretty polished. Um, and so it was just an idea of kind of looking at the chapter and like, okay, what's its essence and what, what title would, would capture that, but also maybe add even another layer of uh, nuance. Um, you know, my, it's a while now since I've wrote flash fiction, but it's a form that I loved writing and that I continue to love reading. Um, and, and I think I really leaned back into that muscle with, with choosing those chapter titles. And as I say, with my flash fiction, flash fiction, again, you're dealing with such constriction. Um, the title it really, really mattered. I think they always matter. Um, but I would always try with my flash fiction for the title to be working super hard and it adding something more, another layer to the story. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about like some of the, I think, social and emotional underpinnings of the choices we make around naming. I'm thinking of naming children. I'm thinking, I guess, also of naming characters in fiction. But if you look at baby naming books, for example, or if you Google like names, you realize that there are eras where certain names become very popular for reasons yeah. that are not entirely clear. Like the culture just decides, you know, we went through a phase where like Madison was a very popular name for a girl and you know, there are, I guess there are some names that are probably enduring in their popularity, but it does tend to shift. Jacob, yeah. Jacob will have like a decade, you know, in the sun and then it'll recede and some other name will surpass it. And uh, that's fascinating to me. But I think it also maybe just subconsciously can put pressure on us to yeah. con to conform or like we find ourselves sort of following those trends and liking those names for reasons we can't even quite put a finger on. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think, yes, maybe we can't always pinpoint, but I think they do sort of reflect a, a cultural moment um, and they tend to reflect, um, you know, people in positions of power, whether it's celebrity, whether it's presidents, whether it's, you know, monarchs, it tends to be people that the culture looks up to, um, you know, becomes often obsessed with. I mean, we are obsessed with celebrity and, and with monarchy and all the rest of it. Um, and so I think it kind of gets back a little bit to my mother naming me Ethel after my, you know, great aunt and that it was almost um, reflective of a deeper desire to sort of rise above and, and to sort of, and 
to connect to the idea of greatness, you know, that I was named after somebody who was perceived on a different level to me and to my mother and who was above us. And that was sort of like something that the hope was you would, you would aspire to that. I was going to say, it's an, it's an aspirational name. As, yeah. And so I think, yeah. And, you know, when, when you see, you know, we, in the UK, we have like, you know, Prince George. Well, you know, we're going to get a lot of Georges. Um, it's that type of thing. And, and what is that about? Um, and I think it is re reflective of, um, first of all, the impact you know, these, these, these characters have on us and, um, these power systems have on us, um, you know, that, that, that they, they affect us in so many ways, even that they would, you know, guide our naming of our, of our children. Like in some ways that's really extraordinary. Um, you know, I remember, was it 1997 when Princess Diana died and Mother Teresa died, you know, there were sort of, I think three months difference in the times of their death. And, um, I was taking a class at the time in college and we were just looking at sort of how much the world mourned Princess Diana so much more than Mother Teresa. And I know both, you know, have different reasons for being controversial figures, but it is just, um, you know, what obsesses us, you know, and who we obsess on. And that, yes, this naming is almost like something that we hope we can somehow be a part of that mythology and that greatness. And yeah, it is fascinating. And, and there's the contagion too, you know, like that, as you say, names go through their time, they have an era. Um, and it's something about rather than trying to come up with more unusual names, it's like, Oh, George is popular. Oh, that's a great name. Oh yeah. There's George up the road and well, my cousin George and you know, well, but I think too, like I, if like just to use Madison as this example, I want to say that name got its hooks into people through the movie Splash, at least in America. Yeah. So it can be some yeah. sort of cultural yeah. thing that is the origin story for a name's popularity within the culture. And Absolutely. I think on a related note, since we're in like movie world, it is fascinating to me how certain people celebrities often do this <laughs> insist on naming their children with a name that no other child has ever had before on planet earth because yeah. this is a special being you know what i'm saying like i yeah. think there's like i i don't know i kind of like i roll a little bit at some of this because i feel like it's an expression of ego you know and, and like Absolutely. a sense a sense of one's own specialness and so there's a part of me that like in a kind of backlash will be like just name your fucking child George, like everyone else. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know no, what I'm no, saying? No, no, I, I absolutely, absolutely. And again, you know, you're signaling singling them out. If you're a celebrity, that's fine. You know, you're going to be spared from from. But if you're just a regular Joe, you know, and you name your child Apple, or um, you know, something that again, yeah, it's going to single them out. Like you really have to consider: is it a gift or is it an affliction? That you know, you have to think about that. Um, I think that's the least of our responsibility. But um, yeah, and that that again, that's that's a big trend, and it's almost like uh, you know, outwitting your fellow celebrity. You know, it's like, <laughs> what name can I come up with? That, as you say, nobody else has this name, and that's narcissism. You know, but, or right. to imagine to imagine that they can keep that as solely theirs, and that it won't indeed become copied and contagious and sought after um because you know once you put it into the canon it's there for everybody else to take so it's just I, whether you would or not i don't know how contagious apple is as a yes. name i'm not sure if i've seen another one I, you know so i guess it works and I, I i actually get that a lot and i think it must be my mispronunciation or how it comes across when i speak but i'll get that it's particularly in the days of the phone when we used to actually all you know remember speak oh, yeah. to each other on the phone oh, yeah I, I actually i actually have nostalgia for that i like talking yeah no really really yeah. it's a dead it's a dead art it's like handwriting you know i talk send... to i talk to my best friend from childhood three or four nights a week i talk that's to him so nice yeah, that we is talk so, for like... that's so special yeah, I just, but I'm just like, yeah, I don't want to text with people. Like, yeah, this is, yeah, it's it is becoming rarer and rarer though, and I do think we're we're missing important connection because of that. But yes, I obviously it's I I I take full accountability. It's the way I must say it. But I get a lot Apple, so Ethel 
apple. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I, and, and, but I'm always like, what? Of course my name's not Apple, but <laughs> okay, we're living in an era where anything is possible. Anything. I talk about that a lot, you know, post-pandemic. I think for me, I realized how naive I was before the pandemic because that was such a surreal time, but it was a time where, you know, the absurd became normal and what I thought could never happen, even something as simple as my daughter's school's closing. You know, it's like... What? No, in no reality did I ever think we could exist in a world where schools would shut down, you know, places of business would shut down. Like it just seemed impossible. And so since then, you know, again, getting back to this novel, I realized how much I threw in things because I feel like that's life now. Everything is coming at us so fast and, you know, different things would happen in the plot. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, is this too much? Is this too much? But I think, no, this is a contemporary novel and this is very reflective of this is happening. This is coming at me. Oh, I, I need to care about this. I need to be angry about this. I need to speak up about this. You know, like there's just so many areas where, and and I think rightly so. You need we need to be standing up much more. We need to be speaking up much more. But it just becomes exhausting. Um, and I, again, you talked about nostalgia. I have nostalgia for a time. Yeah, where where our connection was in real life and in real time, and it wasn't this. Um, I don't know. We're just so disconnected. I feel like really worry about this, you know, the lack of empathy. We've become so desensitized. I don't know. I think that the, whatever like wormhole we went through when the pandemic hit or when 2016 hit and like the impossible suddenly seemed possible. I feel like we're still in that. I feel like we're in some sort of realm of, uh, you know, breakdown or dissolution that feels oh, completely. And I, I've said that in a recent interview, I, I feel we carried it forward. You know, the interview was started speaking in the past tense, you know, and I was saying, no, I, I feel like I certainly, but I, I think for most of us, we've carried that forward and it's a lived experience that it has now we're internalizing that. Like it's, it's not like it's ever going to be passed. I think we're going to continue to process that and, and I do feel like, yeah, the wormhole, like it let in so much that's never going to leave us. Maybe not in our generation. I think yeah. that if we are to get to some better place, it's going to take some time. We're not there yet. Let's put it that way, right? Oh, God, no. Yeah, we're a ways away. <laughs> I wish, I really wish I could be more optimistic, but I, I'm not, I'm not feeling, I'm, I'm so pessimistic. I'm so disillusioned. I'm, I think a lot of people feel that way, but I think yeah. that you know, disruptions, like what I tell myself anyway, is that these ruptures, disruptions in society, kind of the tearing of the societal fabric, it's like upsetting for good reason, but also contains within it the possibility for change, like the seeds yeah. of positive change. And so the question is speed of change and the necessity of yeah. speed of change. I mean, we're getting yeah. off topic, but you know, I think that's what we're all thinking about. It's like, okay, I know we need things to change, but we also need them to change really fast. Yeah. Like when you think about climate and stuff like that. And that's yeah. like the big holdup for me is that I have faith in change because it's the only constant, but I don't yeah. know how much faith I have in the speed with which humanity is able to yeah. shift gears. And, you know, maybe it's not that far off topic in that again, so much of these issues, climate, et cetera, they are fought on the level of words too. That's you know, right. like the propaganda is so powerful. And at the end of the day, it's words and names are words. Um, and I, I think it is. Yeah. It's, it's thinking about the power of words and how we use them. And, um, well, I mean, I, they, I always, I always go back. Sorry to interrupt, but like you no, no. brings to mind the, uh, I remember like the Iraq war. Which, like, you know, it seems like a, seems quaint now. Remember that oh, when back yeah, when things yeah. were simpler. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> you know, but anyway, I, I was very upset by all that and felt it was mm. crazy that we were doing this. And I remember reading an article or something about the rhetoric of war and how the Pentagon would have some spokesman step up to a podium and start talking about targets of opportunity. Yeah. And it's like these kind of sanitized or 
like antiseptic phrases that we kind of just accept as they roll yeah. out of the mouths of official seeming people in the government. Yeah. But then you start yeah. to actually think, well, what is a target of opportunity? Oh, that means like, that's something we're going to blow up. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, yeah. And there's going to be people down there. And like, you know, it starts yeah. to get a lot more complicated when you parse the words. Absolutely. And again, that is what propaganda does. It removes the subject. You know, there is no I, he, she, they, them, you know, it removes the humanity. It removes that sense of, yes, we are talking about human beings here. Um, and when, when you remove that, and when you're talking about casualties of war, etc., you know, that, that they sanitize all of that. And we're forgetting that we are talking about, you know, our fellow brothers and sisters here, um, that it, it it removes their humanity. And again, it, it gets down to the naming, you know, um, we it's often, a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big, big deal. You know, if you name an individual, that's a powerful step. But if you speak, you know, <laughs> without naming that subject and you remove the person entirely, you've done something profound in a negative way. Well, speaking of negative, there are names that become so inextricably associated with say crimes against humanity, uh, or it could be on a personal level. There could be a name of somebody in your family who has hurt a lot of people or something. And so that name becomes associated with toxicity and negative, you know, negative emotions. But yeah. just to give another big, broad example, not a lot of little boys named Adolf in the Western yeah. world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that yeah. name is just done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's yeah. interesting how certain names yeah. can take on, can become so freighted with negativity that people won't even touch them. Well, that's such a great point you raise. And, um, you know, part of my history of trauma is I'm, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and my abuser's name had such power over me for decades. Again, that, you know, I'm talking about flinching at my own name. Like when I heard his name, I, I had such a visceral reaction to it. And I hated it for so, so long. And part of my recovery and part of my healing was to take the power out of that name. And I just did it, you know, myself. It took a long, 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 long time, but it was realizing that I should not allow it to have that power over me because there are, it's, it's, it's a common name and I would encounter it inevitably, you know, several times a year. Um, and so I, made that choice for myself and it was a very empowering one that I would diffuse um, all the toxicity around that name and that I would, you know, not only associate it with that one man, my abuser, that I would completely let that go. And it, it proved extremely powerful to the point now where I, I, I won't say the main, the name doesn't have, it still has like a vibration, it still has a hum to it, um, but it no longer has the power to hurt me. How did you, and how did you just let it go? I, I took a long time. And again, it was um, having that awareness of, oh my God, this name, I hear it. It's so triggering. It's damaging. It's, it continues to hurt me. You know, this idea of um, there's that rush again, you know, what we can and can't talk about. And I think particularly for women, and I think particularly for victims, the sort of the idea of it's in the past leave it in the past, you know, move on, that type of thing. I certainly got those messages um, growing up. Um, and so for me, it was because of that name, that was part of what was keeping it in the present for me, that I was continually encountering that name. I was continually having that negative experience around the name. And so I chose consciously. First of all, I had to recognize it. Oh, wow, this is this is damaging. Um, and then I chose, okay, I, I can make choices. I couldn't make choices about what happened to me in the past, but I can make choice about this. And it took time, definitely. And again, it's the irony of, of being exposed. So each time I would encounter a man by that name, you know, I had to, and <laughs> they would have no idea. Again, it's kind of what's happening internally when we meet people. It's, it's fascinating. They would have no idea, but I was going through a process in my own mind, and a very physical one too. You know, I would take breaths. I would tell myself to relax. Um, and and it, it's worked now to the point where I can meet somebody by that name. And like I said, it's never, it's never not going to register on some level with me, but it has no power over me. Hmm. I was going to say, you like, you're out and you meet some guy with that name in your youth. 
like it's just like forget it yeah Can't, oh totally <laughs> totally you know and actually even to the point of place you know if i met a man who was from that place that see ya it. bye see ya. that was it that, that was, was it, it. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, that is powerful. So again, that's place name, that's individual name. Um, but yeah, yeah. And so again, I, it gets back to sort of what were the bigger question we've been asking all along, you know, is it the name that has the power? Or is it our different reactions to it? Um, and I, I think it's, it's probably the latter. Um, and that can mean so much for so, so many different people. Um, you know, I know growing up in Ireland, particularly with Irish names that were difficult to pronounce, people would often anglicize them. Just, you know, it was too much hassle. It was a reduction every time they were introduced. They didn't want to deal with it. Um, and I always thought, you know, if that's the reason why you're making the choice for other people's comfort, I found something sad about that. You know, our names are so integral to us. They're part of our identity. They can often be our essence. And so the idea that you would change that and let it go, anglicize it for the comfort of others just because of a pronunciation issue. And of course, I can only imagine, you know, what that's like for people who don't have an English name, a non-Western name, um, who but finds here, they... Here's what's interesting. Ahead. Here's what's interesting. Because this is, as I think I said before we started recording, a big issue for me as the host of this show. Like I, I Like my joke is that I'm going to screw up everything else, but at least I can pronounce your name right. You know, and it's important to me that I get it right. Y usually people appreciate that and like understand where I'm coming from. Sometimes, like multiple times, I have had people who might have like a tricky name or a name that I'm, you know, not quite sure how to pronounce. And they'll just be like, oh, I don't care. Just say it however you want to say it. Yeah. And I'm like... No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. How do you say it? <laughs> like, I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to yeah. freestyle on this. Like, that seems crazy to me that you'd be like, yeah, yeah, it's my name, but you can just like, you can interpret it however you want. And like, I guess maybe they've been asked so many times that they just learned to like wave it off, but it's important to me. I'm like, no, I want to say it exactly like you say it. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank you for it being important to you because unfortunately that's not the case with everybody. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. I, I think it's so important. Um, I think it's it, it's a very simple thing to get right. And I think it's an unfortunate and often painful thing to get wrong. So I thank you for that. And I, I am surprised that that is the reaction. But again, I suppose it gets down to the individual and they have the right, you know, to express whatever take they want on their name. But I wonder, as you say, how much of that is it's just been such a deadening experience to have to repeat it over and over and over right. again. Well, um, that's the, that's the question that I have sometimes is like, is it rude to even ask? And yet I have to ask, I, I mean, I guess you can also search out like a YouTube video where it's already been said, but you know, sometimes I don't have time to do that or I forget to do it. And so I'm asking somebody to confirm in an effort to be polite. And I wonder if it's, so I, I can worry sometimes that it's actually perceived as rude to ask. No, and to somehow no, not I, I feel very confident in saying that I think overwhelmingly your guests would really, really appreciate that. Okay. Um, and, you know, for the rare exception, it's it's not worth shifting that sense of responsibility you have, you know, because I, I think it's it's beyond rudeness. I, I think it's just it's a mark of respect. And again, yeah. I think it's it's meeting the essence of that person. And yeah, it's just something I would take a great deal of care and responsibility with because it's such a big issue for me. And I, I, I want to recognize, you know, somebody else's humanity. And because I, I just think it's a universal truth. And of course, there's going to be um, exceptions. But I think it's universally true to that just, names matter. It's basic manners. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah. You know, you say their yeah. name properly. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you from a like practical standpoint, and from like a crafty writerly standpoint, what your process is for titling and naming in your books. I will have, just to give you like something to kind of work off of, I will have usually like a document on my computer or like in a notebook or something where over the course of the writing of a book, I'm jotting down possible titles. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing lists as much for character names, more it's the case where I'm just trying them on. 
on the page, sometimes swapping them out. You know, I'll, I'll sometimes in the past, I think I've gone many pages with like name A and then realized that it's actually name B. And then you just do like a find and replace, right? Right, right. Yeah. Is that but, how do you do it? But um, when you say name A, name B, you don't literally mean that, do you? Like you would give them a name? I would give but, the oh, character but, a name like Joe. Okay. But then okay. like 65, okay. 65 pages in, I'm like, no, his name's actually Harold or something. And it would just change, yeah. you know, then I just do okay. like a find and replace because it's fastest. Yeah. Yeah. Phew. I'm relieved because, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you're going to get very far. I, I don't mean you, you. I mean, we as writers, I don't think you're going to get far if you put in like a placeholder as in like name A, name, because that that's a barrier, right? Um, you know, I think of the spiritual guru Eckhart Tolle, you know, and he really feels very, very strongly on this. I don't feel that strongly, but he's the expert, but you know, he doesn't even believe in naming anything, you know, not, you don't name the tree that you're communing with, you know, you don't name the flower, you, you, you just meditate with them as, as beings, you know, this idea, cause he feels like the naming puts up a barrier, you know, between the that labeling. connection with you. Yeah. The labeling. Exactly. Um, and, and I think I, I have a different take on that, um, just from my own lived experience and sort of my personal take on it. Um, but yes, what you're saying, and, and again, with this novel, saying, I, that's exactly what happened. The name was wrong and everything, because the name was wrong, everything else that followed was wrong. And so, so it was the name I meaning changed. the title or the Nikki No, character? of my character, of my, my secondary character, uh, who was Nikki and became Lily. And once I made that change, it, it was extraordinary, you know, how, how it, it completely shifted everything. It was like I was in a different book. Um, and, and I could just feel the energy and feel the momentum. And, and it, it just, it was like something cracking open. And that was from, a name change. Uh, so I, I know exactly say. what you're saying. And when you say like you're 60 pages in and you realize, no, they're, they're not Joe. That's right. Us as the creators really getting to know the character and they come alive for us in a way that they couldn't because we didn't know them and we're getting to know them and they, they, the why of them and the what of them and all of that. And so that, that makes complete sense to me and resonates with me that Joe is indeed Bruce. Or, yeah. I mean, like, listen, if you're listening and you are working on a book and you're at your wits end and you feel like it's a complete lost cause, try changing a name, change your protagonist's name to Brad and see what happens. <laughs> but I, be... I, I, I would also caution if, if everything's going well and it's working, I wouldn't mess with it because I would think you're setting yourself up so much work because I do think it is a huge shift. Yeah. In, in the storytelling. So, it, you know, don't change the name unless you really feel that's the right choice because you're, you're setting work for yourself. <laughs> what if you make the wrong choice? It's a big deal. <laughs> it really is a big deal. It's a it lot is. of pressure. Um, again, on titling that um, automatic writing, I find that really helpful. I find handwriting, like just, just changing things around, you know, sometimes putting a titles honestly and in, in like a shoe or something <laughs> cowboy boot shaking it up you know and see what one i take out like sometimes you do have to allow for um you know just a little bit of mystery a little bit of mystique you know some other um element you know that fate decides or i don't know sometimes you know there there are forces and powers that that can be smarter than us and and allow for a little bit of um those elements to come into, I think can, can make things really interesting, but I yeah. Buy that. Yeah. And, and again, letting go of the fear. I, I, I got stuck because I, I told myself I'm not good at titles. And then it was sort of examining that. Well, why do you think that? And did anybody ever tell you that? And where does that come from? And is that indeed true? And now, because it can be so satisfying when you hit on that name that you're like, oh, that's it. That's the name. That's the title. Um, it feels fantastic. So now I sort of, I have much more appetite for it. I, I meet it with a whole different energy and enthusiasm that I wouldn't have had in the past because there was just that element of fear to it. Yeah, that makes sense. And it is, as writers, we tend to just know when it's right. It clicks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, an in, it's an intuitive thing. You know, there's nobody, Absolutely. there's nobody sitting next to you usually who's yeah. like, you have chosen well. <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> <laughs> a personal decision. And I should say too, you know, you touched on this, but the metaphysics of names and labeling and the, like the Eckhart Tolle of it all 
is interesting to think about. Like we are born into this world, you know, naked. And that means like without clothing, but also without a name until someone gives us one. Yeah. Like these are conventions yeah. that human beings have created to kind of keep track of one another, essentially. Yeah. But yeah. Th- there's nothing that's, there's no rule that says like we have this name and yet it feels so integral to us once we have had a name bestowed upon us. But, you know, th- the same goes for all the flora and fauna. And yeah. I get where Tole is coming from, where, you know, where you live in a world of labels, they become a kind of screen or a, a, a barricade between you and direct experience. I yeah. get that. But I also think that there is some merit and I, I have some envy for people who can do this. Uh, there is some merit to the idea of say being an expert on the flowers and trees in the place where you live so that when you go out into the world, you know, you're walking down your street or whatever, you can go, Oh, that's a such and such tree. I can't do that. I don't know. A oh, damn either thing. can I. And I love trees. I love, love walking in the woods, but you know, I'm terrible. Same but thing. maybe, well, you know what? Maybe I, I got to rethink this. Maybe it's good. Maybe I'm having more of a direct experience and the namers maybe. have this, this like mediated experience that's somehow diminished because they're too knowledgeable. <laughs> this yeah. is a great, this is a great excuse for me to be lazy and not have to learn this stuff. <laughs> I'm spiritually enlightened. Well, these people know I everything. <laughs> I love it. Direct connection. Well, it's fun to talk about this and it's kind of the, it's, you know, it's a conversation in the world of writing that doesn't happen all that often but i think it's something that we all deal with and last thing i'll say just to kind of bring everything full circle is that you know if we buy into this notion of eras and how names kind of uh, live cyclical existences i think that not only have you grown up and grown into your name and sort of made peace with it but i gotta say that like names like ethel and harry and gertie these kind of like classic old, I'm trying to think of other ones that might fall under that umbrella. There are many, but I feel like they're sort of having a moment. I feel like people are naming their kids the, with those kinds of names more often than they used to. So maybe you're coming back into fashion. Maybe I'm coming back into fashion. Um, yeah. I know I'm in a good place with my name for sure. I think I'm having my own personal moment with my name um, and it feels really, really good. Well, I am not. I continue to languish. And to be, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. What about I Listy? Mean, What's your relationship with Listy? I have no problems with Listy. I love okay. Listy. Yeah. I the agree. thing is, the thing is, it's like I, I, I did not take a pen name. I could have. I decided to just live with my name. It's my name, you know. And and day to day, it does not bother me. I like to make sort of a joke about it. But I think when you have a name that the culture tells you repeatedly over the course yeah. of your life is a punchline. Yeah. How are you not, I mean, if you have any kind of awareness at all, you're going to pick up on that. And so, yeah, I mean, what am I supposed to do? I guess I have to try to make it new. I have to push back <laughs> and redeem <laughs> this cursed name of mine. <laughs> and is it short for Bradley? No, that's no. I just got Brad. That's it on my birth certificate. So it's not Bradley. It's not Bradford. It's just Brad. Oh. So, you know, it's my cross to bear. Well, I, I, the other thing I will say about names is that I do think our spirit surpasses our names and you're doing just fine, Brad. All right. I hope so. It's, uh, it's fun to talk with you, Ethel. Congratulations on Sing I. Thank you. Congratulations on your name. Thank uh, you. And I wish you luck with all that you have going. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Brad. And thank you so much for your podcast.